Today, as we normally do on the third Sunday of the month, we're having Cafe Church down in St. Mary's Hall. There aren't any cameras down there, so I'm recording this brief service of reflection for you who are joining us online. So, welcome here to my office. If I get the camera angles right, you can't see how messy it is. So, welcome to what appears to be a very tidy office. It's my prayer that God will bless us as part of his family, just as much as he is surely blessing the rest of our family as it meets in various places in Black Mount and Bigger and indeed throughout the world. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in a posture of worship as we come before our Heavenly Father. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for this time to sit down together, to open your word, and to consider, to consider you, to consider ourselves, consider the world around us, consider the birds and the lilies, just as you told us to do. Help us, Lord, to quieten our hearts and our minds that we might be able to do just that, to consider. Make us aware of your presence with us. Inspire, breathe into us by your Spirit. And having considered, by the help of your Spirit, help us to plant our feet firmly on the rock that is your Word, so that when the storm winds blow, we will be able to stand and to help others too to stand to stand against the troubles and tragedies that life will inevitably throw at us and as we come into your presence we pray as jesus taught us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we move on in our exploration of the Sermon on the Mount and we come to the passage in chapter 6 about worry. Worry, <laughs> something I believe we all experience. Let's watch this short video before we read the passage. Trouble, 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 trouble. Trouble been dogging my school since the day I was born. Worry, 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 worry just will not seem to leave my mind alone. Worry. Where it feels like this worry is my only friend. Oh. When it comes to things you care about, leave nothing to chance. Oh. Travelers, insurance for auto, home, and business. It's quite a clever advert for insurance, wouldn't you say? It's fun, but I think it highlights a, a lot of the misunderstandings we have when it comes to worry and security. In this morning's passage, Jesus gives us an antidote to worry, but it's better than any insurance policy that Rover could ever get from Traveler's Insurance. Let's read together Jesus's words found in Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 to 34. And if you have your Bibles, you might want to open them with me. 
Let's hear the word of God. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, or consider the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? And see the flowers of the fields grow, or consider the lilies. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of God. This is a very well-known bit of the Sermon on the Mount. It's well known, but I think it's also often misunderstood. The gist of Jesus' teaching in this passage is that his disciples should not worry. The injunction, do not worry, occurs six times in these nine verses. Of course, it's easy to say, don't worry. It's said by a lot of people, by self-help gurus and even pop musicians. You, you remember the song a few years back by Bobby McFerrin, Don't Worry, Be Happy. It's a peppy little song. But if you're weighed down by anxiety, I should imagine that the song, along with the platitudes of self-help gurus, just grade on your nerves rather than help alleviate any of your worries. The problem with that song, and a lot of advice to not worry, is that they don't give us much reason not to worry. Not worrying is great. Doctors tell us that being free from worry is what we need. It's good for our health. The problem, though, is that there is a lot in life to worry about. We worry about our health. We worry about our family. We worry about our relationships, our jobs, the economy. We worry about climate change and the war in Ukraine. We worry about all these things with good reason. They are worrisome indeed. Jesus in our passage, however, is giving reasons for not worrying, unlike the self-help gurus and Bobby McFerrin. Jesus gives comparisons between us and the natural world, and he gives his disciples a powerful strategy to use to defeat worries in their own lives. But before we get to those, let's think first about definitions. What is worry? In the English language, it can mean lots of different things. The semantic field of this word stretches all the way from a healthy concern for someone that we love, all the way to debilitating anxiety. What did Jesus mean? by that word when he used it here. What did Jesus mean by worry? 
The Greek word used here is the same word that is used in the story of Mary and Martha. You remember that story. Jesus says to Martha when she complains to him about her sister sitting at his feet while she does all the work, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. One thing, however, is needed. And that one thing your sister Mary has chosen. In that passage, Mary is worried to the point of distraction. She is so obsessed with trying to do what she believes needs to be done that she is distracted from what is necessary. That seems to me to be Jesus's definition of worry, both here in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Martha and Mary story. Worry is being distracted, not necessarily being distracted by bad things. Mary is distracted by the good that she wants to do for Jesus, but she is distracted all the same. She is distracted from what Jesus really needed from her at that moment. In the passage, Jesus, Jesus singles out two things that his audience might be worried about. And the two things are what they will eat and drink and what they will wear. Most of us, however, worry about more things than just those two. In modern Scotland, there are very few people who are worried about what they're going to eat today, though sadly there are some who worry about that and with the economic situation that might be getting worse for a lot of people. But likewise, there are few people who are worried about what they will wear to cover their bodies. And I don't think it was any different for Jesus's original audience. I think they too were probably burdened by more than just worry about food and clothing. By singling out these two things, food and clothing, however, I think Jesus is actually including everything that we have cause to worry about. Worrying about food represents worry about having what is necessary to get along in life. A food is basic to what is necessary. It's needed. But we can all think of lots of things that are needed in life besides food. Things like income, good health, a healthy environment, and a secure home. When Jesus tells his listeners not to worry about food, he's telling them not to worry about the daily necessities. The necessities of life are all included under the heading food and drink. It's the same thing that Jesus was doing when he taught his disciples to pray. He taught them to ask for their daily bread. And by that he meant for his disciples, he meant for us to ask and to trust that our daily needs, whatever they are, be they food or anything else, might be met by our Heavenly Father. And in this, this passage, when, when Jesus tells his disciples not to worry about clothes, he isn't thinking of the necessity of covering our bodies to keep warm. He's thinking of other things that we worry about. This is worry about how we look, how we're going to feel, what others are going to think about us. When Jesus makes the comparison with flowers of the field. He, he speaks of their splendor as compared to King Solomon's splendor. This is worry about things that are not as necessary as our daily bread, but things that are just as important. This is worry about things that have to do with our identity and with our self-worth. So Jesus is telling his disciples in this passage not to worry about anything. By speaking of food and clothing, he's including everything we might very well worry about. But why? Why should we not worry? 
Well, Jesus gives us the answer to that question by citing two examples from nature. He tells his disciples to look, to consider the birds in the first instance and the flowers of the field in the second. The birds don't worry about what they will eat, where they will get what is necessary for life. And the flowers don't worry about how they look, how well they are dressed, what their identity will be. They don't worry about how they will look to others. The flowers don't spend their lives laboring and spending cloth to look like they do. It, it comes naturally. As the birds are fed by their heavenly father, so the flowers are clothed by him. And they are more splendid, Jesus says, than even Solomon. Solomon, who spent a great deal of effort to appear the way that he did. According to Jesus, in these two examples from nature, the reason we should not worry is because we have a heavenly father who cares for us even more than he cares for birds and flowers. Another reason that Jesus gives for not worrying is because it's a waste of time and energy. Most of the things we worry about, we can't control. Jesus says who, by virtue of worrying about his or her mortality, is going to add another hour to his or her life. Worry like that, which, which Jesus describes here, arises from the false idea that we are in charge of everything. It arises from that idea that we must control the outcome of things. But the truth is, there is little that we can control. But according to Jesus, there is one who does ultimately control all things. And once again, he reminds us that we have a heavenly father, a father who cares about what happens to us. And no matter what happens, he will always be our heavenly father. Ultimately, his will will be done. And that is good news. Despite the trouble and the pain and the death, that comes in this life. God is in control, but we and those first disciples have little faith that this is so. What Jesus means in verse 30 by telling his disciples that they have little faith is not that they do not, that they aren't trusting something. The disciples do have faith. They do trust something, but that something is not always God. There, our faith is often more in themselves than in God. And I know from experience that trusting myself with anything is a very shugly peg on which to hang things. Ultimately, in worrying, we are not trusting God. That's why Jesus says that to worry about these things is the way of the pagans. By which Jesus means those who don't recognize that there is a, a heavenly father who will take care of those who trust in him. When I worry, I often make myself or put myself in the place of God. I make myself responsible and I trust, but more often rightly doubt, that I can control the outcome of things. And in doing so, I fall into the sin of idolatry, just like any other pagan whose trust is put in anything that is not God. Finally, how are we then to live that we might be free? From worry. What does Jesus say here? Well, the answer to that question comes in verse 33 that we all have probably memorized from childhood. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things 
will be given to you as well. In verse 32, Jesus has said that it is futile to run after the things we worry about. Better, he says here in verse 33, to run after what he calls the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. And here's a link to the whole tenor of the Sermon on the Mount. This is not a self-help book. It is rather a course of teaching for disciples. And a disciple is called to lose his life. Jesus says in Luke 9.23, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Folks sometimes, however, look at Christian faith as an insurance policy, like in that advert. A policy they take out to preserve their lives just as they are, instead of losing them. Folks often speak as if believing in Jesus will help them keep all the things that they are worried about. But Jesus defines discipleship as just the opposite. For Jesus, discipleship is to give up everything for the kingdom, to be concerned for God's kingdom and his righteousness above all else. A life in Jesus, a life as a disciple, according to the, the Apostle Paul, is to no longer live our own lives. Paul says there in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What Jesus is saying here in our passage is that for a disciple to worry about his or her life, that she or he has already given up, is to be distracted from the kingdom, the kingdom which is the one treasure that will not rust, that will not fade, and cannot be stolen, the kingdom that has been gifted to us, we who trust in Jesus. To worry about food, the necessities of life, and clothing, the splendor of life, is to waste our effort. We cannot, by worrying, put food on the table. We cannot, by worrying, keep our loved ones safe. We cannot, by worrying, preserve our good name or even prevent our own death. And if that is so, then what does Jesus mean at the end of verse 33 when he says, And all these things will be given you as well? It sounds as if Jesus is giving us that insurance policy, promising to make everything smooth sailing for his disciples if they just set the kingdom and God's righteousness at a higher priority than the other things in life, but still keeping those other things as priorities. But what I think Jesus is meaning here is that when we are sold out for the kingdom and for God's ways, when we get things into the proper kingdom perspective, instead of worrying about all these other things, we can really enjoy them. Enjoy them for what they are. Things that are good gifts from a loving father. But things that are not ultimate. Things that are not eternal. Things that we may easy, easily very well lose one day. They are not things we grasp. They are not things that we clutch on to. As a disciple, we have given these things up already. And our Father God, in his grace, having given us the kingdom first, gives us back these things also to enjoy as well, to enjoy them for what they are, enjoy them in the season that we have them, and sadly, sometimes regrettably, giving them up when it's time to give them up again. 
for the disciple who is committed to the kingdom and God's righteousness, losing these things will certainly be a blow, but they will not mean devastation. The kingdom will always remain for them. When it comes to worry, one question remains. How do I do it? How do I keep from worrying? I'd like to be able to take a pill to relieve my anxieties. I'd like to be able to switch a switch. I'd like to find a simple formula, say a, a single prayer. But in my experience, it's not that easy. I'm no expert at this. I worry a lot. But the wisdom that I have gleaned from others is that tackling worry, tackling anxiety is a process. It is, as Eugene Peterson has said, a long obedience in the same direction. It has to do with daily setting my sights on the kingdom daily hearing those words of Jesus, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. Hearing these and other words over and over again. It comes with training my heart to love the kingdom in God's way above all else. And of course, it comes with working on this together, together with the family of God, working together as we hold up the kingdom to each other and hold each other up in prayer and also hold each other in account for the commitment that we have made to our loving Heavenly Father. May God give us the strength and the wisdom along with his gift of grace to be people who are worry-free and kingdom bound. Last week I was privileged along with Callum, our youth worker, to spend some time with primary school students who are transitioning to high school next year. We talked about the changes, challenges and choices that they will face in this next year and in the years ahead. And at the end of our session, Callum introduced us to the idea of a paper tiger. We all made tigers out of origami paper. As we considered the fact that many of the things we might be fearing in the days ahead of us are merely paper tigers, that they are not real. Some of our troubles, however, are real. But we are reminded in Jesus's words that we are to deal with them by his grace one day at a time, and not be paralyzed by the what might be, but is not yet come to pass. As we listen to this next song that's taken from this passage of scripture that we've been thinking about, let's consider how we might seek first the kingdom and God's promise to give us not just the kingdom, but these other things as well.
prayers today are in the first person. Will you bow your head with me and make these words your own as I pray them? Lord Jesus, the stresses in my life often reach a dangerous proportion, or, or so it seems. My body, mind, and spirit struggle to keep up physically, mentally, and yes, spiritually. Some days anxiety stalks me like a deceitful predator, and the temptation to worry draws me in. I know better. But some days the challenges outweigh the truths buried inside. My trust in you fades into the background, giving fear and concerns permission to discourage me. In those moments of apprehension, Lord God, help me remember that I belong to you that you are not the author of fear or anxiety, but you are the giver of love and a sound mind. Lord God, teach me your ways to respond to problems by giving thanks in them. Your word assures me that you are always there with me. You are the blessed controller of all things and nothing escapes your attention in my life. You have given me every tool and spiritual blessing to fight against those things that try to steal my peace. You promised that when I'm stressed and burdens are trying to weigh me down, I can come to you. You will give me rest. Whether the anxiety stems from work, parenting, finances, physical issues, or even world conditions, you are there. You are Lord. You are there to shoulder the weight. Teach me to recognize the stressful trials as tools for you to shape me and rearrange me. Through those difficult times, you will teach me patience, enlarge my faith, and help me see things I couldn't see before. When I'm clueless as to what to do, Lord, I want to turn to you first and, and not last. Forgive me, Lord, for trying to handle things on my own. The need to be in control sometimes gets a stronghold on my life. That only makes things worse. Lord, I want to trust you more and see things from your perspective and not my own. No one makes me feel uptight, angry, or stressed. And no one forces me to react negatively. I choose to respond according to my beliefs, but I believe you are in control. I believe you created all things and hold all things in your hand. I believe that you are truly God. When an anxious thought creeps in, Help me to stop and relax, to take that thought captive, and to turn apprehension into a calm prayer for deliverance. Lord God, revamp my belief system. Show me a new way to handle life according to your way. No matter what issues I am dealing with, no matter how big the problems or situations, Lord, I am laying them all at your feet today. As I focus on you, remembering your promises and your words, 
Lord, I believe you will fill me with a peace that is beyond all our understanding. Lord, I pray these prayers in your precious name. Amen. Folks, thanks for joining me this morning. Uh, let's receive God's blessing now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Mm -hmm.